here. This is really awesome. All right, thank you. So take it away, Randy. <laughs> yeah, I think you want to hear me talk for a while yet, don't you? Can you wait, Randy? <laughs> All right. Okay, so I threw this together uh, just just to show our beekeeping's different everywhere. I mean, I, I I know beekeeping this hair foothills really well. I don't know anything about beekeeping here in Manitoba, um, but just to show a little different pers perspective on it. Here's me and my two sons. This is Eric and Ian, who now are uh, officially running the operation. Um, Beekeeping started in California, uh, just at the time of the gold rush, the first beehives were brought over by boat. Uh, California at that time was a bee paradise, and they rapidly expanded the numbers, started shipping uh, honey, and beekeeping just took off uh, from that point uh, on. Where I live up in the foothills, we have um, uh, our rainfall in the, in the winter, um, a dry summer, and, and this, is, I guess, is an old time average. The last few years, these blue bars would be down uh, way down. We, we typically go um, these five months with maybe a tenth, two tenths of an inch of rain over the entire five months. Just, uh, we don't get any rain at all for, during the summer. And, um, well, this is showing for Fahrenheit at 30, uh, 37 degrees. Uh, with the day I left, it was right down here. So we do get uh, dropped down, hard ever drop down much below 20 degrees uh, uh, Fahrenheit. So anyway, a wet winter, um, not too cold, um, really, miserable working conditions, often just above freezing, that bone-chilling type of cold, and then a, um, a, a fairly warm, uh, bone-dry, low-humidity uh, summer. Um, this is typical uh, summer for us. Um, there's nothing for the bees at, at, at all, um, except for a little bit of honeydew from an other species of, of tree right here. So much of the, the season is just the bees just sitting there, not doing, doing much. Plus, in the springtime, we have this lovely a uh, small tree that grows abundantly with these big, beautiful spike flowers about this long, fragrant, um, really interesting uh, big uh, fruit on them and toxic to honeybees. Um, uh, interesting thing is that I have people who buy, me nu buy nukes from me and they said the reason that I buy nukes from you is because I live in a high buckeye area and your nukes are the only ones that don't die from buckeye poisoning and I don't, I don't breed for uh, resistance to buckeye poisoning, but I don't breed off any dead colonies either. So it could, there could be selective, <laughs> selective pressure that way. What we see is that um, when I watch my bees, they will work this for nectar, and nectar is not uh, toxic to the bees, it's the pollen that's toxic, and we don't see them working there for pollen, except for we had a year, a few years ago, this blooms concurrently with a, a blackberry, an invasive blackberry, which has a lot of nectar and pollen, and um, as long as the two bloom concurrently, we don't have too much problem, but there was a late season frost right when the blackberry was setting buds, and the frost killed all the buds on the blackberry. Any that weren't underneath the shade lost them all, so the California buckeye bloomed with no competition, and it just wiped out colonies all throughout the Sierras. You just walk into the yard, and, and the adult bees are walking out of the hive. They look like ghosts. They're, they're kind of white colored. You open the lid, it smells like cat piss inside, inside, and the brood is all just dying. It looks like American fowl brood and EFB and everything else that can go wrong will happen at the same time. And it, it just toasts those colonies are until they, the remaining ones can uh, remove the last of that pollen and, uh, and get moving on. So um, uh, it's a native plant uh, and a European honeybee doesn't recognize it as a toxic plant. Um, interestingly, I was in the Midwest, and somebody was just, a beekeeper was describing, he showed me a photograph, he goes, hey, my brood's dying right, right here. And he says, what, what do you think that is? I said, God, if I was in California, I'd say that's buckeye poisoning. Do you have any Aeschylus? Aeschylus is the genus, the horse chestnut. And he goes, yeah, I got a great big Aeschylus tree, horse that chestnut tree right next door. And I said, well, it might be toxic too. So only Californians talk about it, but, but there's toxic plants. Um, around. We have another one at high elevation that'll wipe out colonies too. Um, climate change has been really rough in California. This is, was a typical scene the last few years. All these pine trees just dying from uh, drought. These are all long established trees that the ground moisture just completely ran out and uh, so we, we do have considerable fire da uh, danger uh, there. It looks like we, last year and this year, we maybe cross our fingers coming out of the, of the drought. And I threw this one in, uh, I threw a couple slides in the last minute here, just to show you basically what we, what we do is, you know, we, we may feed a little bit in the spring, not really necessary most of the time. We're very proactive for Varroa early in the season and keep an eye on European fowl brood. Then before the honey flow is, uh, comes on, we make sure we, we, we manage Varroa. 
hop really big on varroa as soon as we get the uh, honey off. And then we focus on, upon rearing, uh, getting our last chance of, of varroa uh, down very low. And then we are our richer bees, uh, build them up with lots of protein in order to go into the winter so that they're in a good shape for um, almond pollination the next spring. So I'm gonna, right now I'm gonna do a 360 from winter to back to this date now. So this is typical, this is how my hives look uh, right now. We haven't had snow on them for a few years. Um, but so this year we're back to getting snow on them. Um, starting uh, first week in January, uh, we start to get some alders um, uh, blooming. And alders in the bee books, it says that it's an incomplete pollen. The bee books are all wrong. It's, you know, we found out in the experiment, that 2013 experiment that I ran, where uh, because of the weather, there was zero coming into the hives, zero pollen. I checked it microscopically several times. The only species coming in was alder pollen, and the bees just rooted up and reared beautiful uh, full frames of brood and bees solely on, almond, on alder pollen. So that tree pollen was 100% nutritionally complete uh, for the bees. Unfortunately, most springs, it rains a lot during this period of time. So if it's, if it's raining, then we get out there and we, we feed them some pollen stuff. Otherwise, they'll build up on the alder pollen. So when it starts coming in, this is really good for us. Um, here's alder pollen here, nice, nice brood on that. Um, if it's not raining, uh, if it is raining, then we feed them the pollen stuff. Um, okay, so our whole year starts, is focused upon this February 15th date. Um, and that's when the almonds start to bloom, the, uh, uh, the first to bloom, generally right around within a few days of that. So the whole year, that's in the back of our head. That's, that's our main source of income, is almond uh, pollination. So we're watching uh, this date all, all the time. Um, this is California almonds. It's a C to C. Um, we've got, uh, we just passed a million acre uh, levels of uh, almonds uh, there. We grow uh, over 80% of the world's almonds. Huge farm gate value. Um, a million acres of these all come into bloom within a, a two week uh, period and they can't set a crop unless they get bee population. So um, they're really dependent upon us uh, beekeepers. This is, this, if, if the almonds were to disappear tomorrow, my guess is we'd probably drop the number of colonies in the United States down to, to maybe 30% of what they are right now. That's the only reason we're maintaining these high levels because it's, uh, we're exceeding the carrying capacity of land for honey production in, in most states in the United States only simply to, dis to supply the demand for bees for almond pollination. And this is how it looks when they come into bloom. As far as you can see, it is just solid bloom. These are soft shell trees. The hard shells have twice as many blossoms on them. And they're, just, they're just solid white. Um, we typically stock uh, two colonies per acre on the, on the almonds. And the reason for this is the almonds are planted typically in four uh, rows in an orchard. And what you have is, um, you have a, uh, actually this is an odd one here. Uh, you have uh, an early blooming cultivar, and then you have a single row of that, and then two rows of the main cultivar, typically non perel and then one row typically of a late cultivar. And you, hope, you have to have two cultivars blooming at the same time, and you have to have bees hopping back and forth. The bees don't recognize them as, as the same tree, so they'll work right down a single row and not do any cross-pollination. So what you want to do is crowd the bees enough that the, the bees from any one hive have to go to several rows, and when a bee's coming back from non-perel and another bee's heading out towards an A+, when they brush at the entrance, there's pollen transfers from one body to the other inadvertently, and that's how we get the cross-pollination uh, on them. Okay, um, I did add this, so if you have children, you, you can cover your eyes. This is uh, almond sex happening right here. Um, <laughs> uh, this is, that's what it's all about. It's all about sex. This is the, the, we have to carry, we, they hire our bees. It works out to be about a penny a bee rent when you calculate how many bees are in the colony um, for that three week period. It's little so one week sometimes, sometimes up to a month just to transfer the male gametes, the sperms, from the, uh, um, from the trees of one cultivar to the receptive uh, stigmas of the uh, uh, other cultivar. The almonds um, first flowers, in order to avoid self-pollination, they first produce the pollen, and then after they've shed their pollen, then they produce nectar. So we first get um, uh, the pollen flow, the nectar flow uh, follows us, and um, uh, the almond honey, al almond honey is, um, 
uh, bitter, it tastes like bitter almonds, so it's not a honey that is normally saleable unless you have a, uh, a special market for it. So those million acres require two million hives brought in, and they come all over. I live just off of Interstate 80, and we just see truckload after truckload of bees just coming in with nets over them all through November, and then depending upon how desperate the growers are in the spring, we'll see them start coming back through again in, uh, in January and February as beekeepers in the rest of the country when the growers bid the price up and say, okay, well, we're willing to pay you $250 if you pry them out, the, out of the snow and haul them out. And the beekeeper says, okay, then I'll do that. So a lot of, so bees are held back in other parts of the country until the growers bid the price up uh, high enough. And it's, it's, it's all the growers, it's the growers bidding against each other. It's an inelastic demand because the to get crop insurance on your almond crop, you have to have a receipt saying that you rented two colonies per acre or you don't qualify for crop insurance. The, the requirement doesn't say how many bees are inside those uh, hives. So the going rate as of last week was $240 for a box that had, a, if you claim you had four frames of bees in there, okay? When the growers get desperate, they, they need them. We're small scale beekeepers. They're, they're, here's our fleet of trucks right here. They're all just small trucks. We're boom loaded. We've talked about going palletized for years, but where we go, we'd only use a palletized operation for a very short period of time for this. The rest of the time, our yards are all too small for uh, forklifts. So uh, we're very happy with our low, low cost. Uh, we can repair these ourselves and uh, we just caravan in to t take care of when the trucks break. By the way, I don't know what it is, but these trucks can run all, we use old cheap trucks they run beautifully all year long, and they all choose to break down in the same week of the year. <laughs> and, and we just know what's going to happen. And just, water pumps go out, you know, uh, transmissions go out, everything happens on, because it, it's about a 10-day window to move everything, to, to make your half your year's income, and that's when all the trucks always break. So it's always, I'm, I'm glad that Eric's now dealing with the stress of it rather than me. And then when you get down there, then you often hit mud. The almond growers make no provision whatsoever for the beekeepers as far as roads or places to put your bees or anything like that. We're supposed to just figure it out. And I don't know if you see the issue here. Notice that the ground is flat in the bottom of the valley. That means if you get enough rain, you have a flat lake down there and it gets pretty messy. So here we, we, we unload them in drops typically of a dozen to 24 throughout the orchard. Um, and while we're unloading them, the bees immediately come out of the hives, and before we've got half the hives off the truck, they're already foraging uh, and bringing back loads of pollen uh, from those hives, if, if we bring them in late. I took this picture, um, or my sons took this picture three days ago. They went back to this orchard and shifted the hives sli <laughs> slightly to, to get them up in the berms between the trees like that. So um, uh, you have to, we watch the weather very carefully. Uh, not all beekeepers watch the weather. Um, one of the things about um, feeding syrup to bees, you really want to have the entrance above water level, otherwise the feeding of syrup doesn't, doesn't do that much. Um, so, yeah, and it's, you know, it breaks my heart to see these beekeepers, especially ones who have maybe sent their bees out with a broker from somewhere else, and they don't know what's happening, and they're hearing the horror stories, and they're just, they don't know, but it's, it can be a mess. And then uh, Hugh Evans took the uh, picture of me a couple of years ago, when we put the last hive on the ground, it's like, wow, the pressure's off. Because we get paid no matter what happens at that point, once the bees are on the ground. So you work for a whole year for this moment of saying, oh, we just placed all the hives. And then it feels really, really good. And actually, right after this picture is when I handed the checkbook over to my sons. This was two, uh, two years ago. Um, then the almond uh, come into bloom, uh, and they, uh, uh, the, the bees start working. At this point, some of the hives will suddenly collapse because suddenly it's just so crazy for foraging that the, 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 bees, and the, the bees just, um, if, if they're at the wrong point in the spring turnovers, they have a bunch of older bees and they don't have enough new bees coming out to replace them, they start foraging and they just, just disappear. Um, they also don't have very land, many landmarks. So what I've noticed is, um, on years where if some of these orchards are mechanically pruned, so they look identical, and then you get a, the, the grower says, oh, put a drop of bees here in the middle, there's no landmarks, and the colony will depopulate, all the bees flying out will drift to some uh, other hives else, elsewhere. I thought it was CCD at first, until it kept happening at the same drop in the same yard, and I realized, no, they're just flying out, and they, 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 they can't find their way back, and they drift to other hives. 
Here's some hard shells here so you can see the, the density of the flowers. So the hard shells are the last uh, cultivars to, to bloom. So as the, the soft shells, the early cultivars, are putting out nectar, these guys are putting out pollen and we just get uh, these, uh, if the weather's good, we get these incredible flows at that time. And then if you want to see magic, show up in March in a hard shell orchard at petal fall. And you can't see it here. All you see is black trunks, white ground, white blossoms, and it's a snowfall, the petals coming down, and it all smells like perfume. <laughs> and you walk through this thing, I am in fairyland or something here. It's just, people, visitors come out and they just go, where is my camera? And it's just click, 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 because it's just, um, it's surreal being in the almond orchards at petal fall in the, in the hard shells. You, just, I, I, you know, I've pollinated almonds for 40 years, and it's still surreal, and just, it's just, I get goosebumps even talking about it, because it's just such an amazing thing. Now, I showed this presentation in Sweden a couple years ago, and they said, why in the world did you take your bees to Amos? And I said, what, what do you mean? He says, they all get killed by pesticides. I said, what makes you think that? And they said, well, we saw the movie by, uh, by More Than Honey, by Marcus Imhoff. I said, oh, that's interesting. Well, Marcus came over two years before he filmed this movie and stayed with me at my house for a month. And I introduced him to all the beekeepers. And then he came back and then he filmed the movie. And here's a picture of me helping the crew film the movie. And what they were doing this day, they had a, a spray bottle of water and they were trying to mimic a shot that showed the bees getting sprayed with fungicides. And then after I left, they swapped out the water for a can of bug spray, and they sprayed the bee, and they killed the bee on the bloom, and then they showed that worldwide, saying this is what happens to bees and almonds. And I go, you know, we beekeepers in California may not be as smart as you guys, but we would not be bringing our bees in if they, if they sprayed them with insecticides. That's ridiculous. That, that does not happen. These, these growers spend a lot of money for those hives, to rent them, they're not going to spray pesticides if they think they, they hurt them at all. So that's, that's just a, a fantasy. Okay, so we come back from almonds and the bees are just, just busting, okay? They, they do really well in the almonds. If you, take, if you take shitty bees into the almonds, you get shitty bees back. If you take good, healthy hives into the almonds, you get incredible colonies back that are just not quite to swarming, uh, usually about 10 days after almonds, that they'll be ready to swarm. <coughs> um, so at, at this point, we, uh, we take our breeders and we start, we start breeding. We actually start breeding uh, grafting queens before we get the bees out of almonds. Um, we were going to start grafting this last week, but the day that we're, the girls were supposed to show up, we had this huge snowstorm, so we called it off. But so as soon as the snow starts to melt, we'll be setting up. We'll put our breeder queens, uh, we break them all down into singles so they don't swarm, and then put them on a, a protected area so if it's raining, I can get out there and, and pull them out. What I've been doing the last few years is I take two of these uh, queen excluder uh, custom uh, frame inserts and I drop them in so I can confine the queen uh, there in each of these. And then I do a rotation of uh, six combs uh, uh, twice, so you rotate twice a week. So um, uh, two, that, that works to a 21 day cycle. So what you do is uh, by doing this, you always have the queen for three three to four days confined to one comb, and the six combs do a perfect rotation. So you always have a frame of freshly emerging larvae for grafting. It makes grafting really quick. I love this. It takes me just a few minutes to do it for the breeders twice a week and uh, rotate those uh, frames. So we need ripe queen cells by mid-March. The bees are typically released from almonds the first to second week of March, and we want to have ripe queen cells the day we get them back because we've got to hit the ground running because we have a huge demand for nukes starting in April. So we have to get these uh, queens made it out. So we, um, uh, I don't know, we do a few thousand uh, uh, queen cells. We sell a huge market for queen cells also um, uh, in our area. So we sell a lot of queen cells. Um, we don't take any, don't let the weather bother us. If it's snowing, we just keep grafting because the weather is so changeable that almost every year within, um, during uh, the two, during the first couple of weeks that the uh, uh, virgins are ready to mate, we will generally get a uh, good mating uh, weather at least one day, and we get to mate it out. So we just go ahead and do it. If we have to junk, junk a bunch of them, we just junk them, but we don't ever stop on the queen ring. This is nonstop. We have a schedule of how many queens we're going to rear in on which days. Okay, so as soon as the, the bloom drops off the almonds, uh, they start to leaf out. And they are just deserts. There is nothing whatsoever for the bees to eat. So we want to get them 
out, out of there. So we load them up, bring them back. So we are unloading back up the foothills. Now the, the valley floor is like at 50 degrees eleva- 50 feet elevation. We live at 3,000 feet elevation. Here's the morning, here's all the frost up here. So we take them out of springtime and we move them back to early winter, back at a higher elevation. One advantage of that is these colonies are chock full of drones. They're just busting at the seams. So they're ahead of any other feral colonies around. So we, that helps us to control our, our matings because we just flood our mating environment with drones from, these, uh, from our own colonies. Uh, the colonies look like this. They're ready to split. There's just uh, tons of brood. And now at this point, I'm going to go back to, um, uh, Jeff was, did that presentation on the economics. So when I started doing this a, uh, a couple years ago um, for my sons, I, I make a spreadsheet and I said, okay, how many hives are we coming back to almonds? How, what's the average frame strength? So how many frames are covered with bees? And then this is where every single frame is going to go. So we, what, the end result, we're going to have uh, this, that year, a few years ago, we only sold 800 nukes. We got, we're selling over 1,000 the last couple of years. So uh, we have a certain amount are going to go for early nukes that are, are for sale. And then we, uh, after th- we do those, we're going to do a later grafting when the weather is actually better. And those are going to be replacement bees um, uh, for us, uh, for new queen colonies. Um, so we, we figure out how many frames go for them. And then we're going to also have uh, nukes to replace our queens that we run through on the second year. Um, what we, we had, we were replacing all our queens every single year in the spring. And then when people would call up and say, hey, um, you want, we want you know, 100 nukes, and we said, well, we're sold out. And they go, oh man, I really want some of your bees. You know? And we say, well, you know, we got some really nice second year queens you know, and there's, uh, in coming back from Ammons. If you want to take a nuke with a second year queen, and we'll tell you as a second year queen, she'll be more likely to swarm and you probably have to replace her later, you know, we'll, we'll sell you at the same price. And they go, sure. And then the next year, they say, hey, we want 100 nukes, but we want them all with second year queens. And the next year they said, well, we want 200 nukes, we want them all with second year queens. And I said, okay, what am I missing here? And the nukes we sell with second year, with first year queens, typically have maybe two frames of brood. The queen's laying, we check the brood pattern, they look good. The nukes with second year queens, they've got four to five frames of sealed brood, and they are ready to, to transfer the next day into a box because they're going to explode. The nukes with second year queens make a honey crop. Nukes of first-year queens are beautiful nukes, but they don't make quite the honey crop. So I talked to my sons, and I said, are we just being stupid here? So we said, <laughs> my son said, yeah, okay, no more sales of nukes of second-year queens. <laughs> so now we take those queens, the good-looking queens that come back from Ammons, put them in a little larger nuke for ourselves, and those would be our, our well, you could say honey producers, but many of their draw, they're foundation drawers. I'll get to that. They draw the foundation uh, for us to make up the, um, the frames that we sell in our nukes. And then what we do, we start a bunch of nukes, our last round of nukes that we make in the spring when the weather's really good and good mating, we'll put those queens into uh, small weak nukes and, that, and they will mature as the nectar and pollen flow drop off so they can stay in a nuke for a long time without overcrowding the nuke. And, they're, so, and it kind of puts those queens on hold. So in August, when we then want to requeen our second year colonies, we got all the replacement queens in these, in these by that time we built up the, these little weak nukes into singles and we're ready to then, uh, that, that will replace the queens for the, uh, when we kill off the second year queens. Um, and then we'll also, over, we're, we've been experimenting with overwintering nukes following uh, what beekeepers do in, in BC and uh, we're working that one out to, to help us out. Anyway, this has turned out to work really well for us to keep track of the operation as far as, as, far as frames. Where does every single frame in our operation go and which one's gonna make us the most money with the least amount of work? Here is the business model. Pre-assembled frames cost us $2 per frame. If I draw them out, fit, uh, those combs, and fill them full of honey, then let's say you're making $1.50 a pound in the honey, I'm adjusting it down for you guys, your net return per frame after you cut, after, uh, subtract the frame there is $7.50. Now, if you take that same comb and just have it draw it out and then cover it with bees and some brood and a queen the next year, we sell them for $30 a frame for nukes at $160. I don't know how much your nukes sell for here. And our net return per frame is $28 as opposed to $7.50. So our business, after selling 
bees in, uh, renting bees in almonds is we buy 5,000 pre-assembled frames every spring and we make a $28 ad margin on each one of those frames. We run our operation thinking about how much, you have X number of hives, each one has X number of frames, how much do we make per frame? So we, I, I do the math of our operation, is how much money do I make per frame? What's my value added? And I get a whole lot more money turning that frame into a nuke rather than into extracting honey, and it's a lot less work, and all my work's done in the spring pretty much. So that's, that's our business model. Okay, so we come back to the, uh, we make up our nukes, and at that point we have a really nice mixed pollen flow coming in from, a, a nice, from all kinds of wildflowers. So the colonies build up very, very nicely on them. And then we do assembly line nuke making. So what we do is we have a um, big steel table, uh, a big steel um, door, and we have two sawhorses, and we throw that door down over the sawhorses in each yard. And then we, we uh, break up in the crew. One person um, uh, pops the lids on the hives. If you've got wall-to-wall -wall bees, and when we, we look in the yard in general, when we first see the first hint of queen cells being formed, that's when we want to nuke them right then, just before they're going to start swarming. So we, you go along, you pop the lids. They're, they're double deeps. If they're wall-to-wall -wall bees, they're nukeable. If they still have a little bit of room, you put the lid back on, and you'll catch them again the next week. So we just we prevent virtually 100% of swarming in our operation by catching them just before um, that. <clears throat> then on, these, on the table, we put on some deboxers here. So the guy picks up the, um, splits, splits a, 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 a double, brings over the upper box, which is heavier with honey, goes on to the, to the left hand deboxer, and then he brings over the lower box, which is light with honey, with more brood, and that goes on to the right hand deboxer. So each of us making nukes has two deboxers on the front. You push it down, pop the frames up, so we can very rapidly move the frames out. Then we have a third guy whose job is nothing but just keep stocking us with empty nuke boxes off the truck and then back onto the truck. So we can just go like this, and just transfer frames, look for the queen into those nuke boxes, just lickety split. Two of us work side by side. We put the frames in the same order in the nuke boxes. So a honey frame nearest to us, a drawn comb farthest away, and the two frames of brood in, 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 them, in them. So because we do the same order, we can fill each other's nuke boxes without talking. So we just, it's just full tilt. As fast as they, the guys can bring over boxes, we're nuking them up. As soon as we've got four frames in the five frame nuke box, we pull the frames together, make sure there's enough bees. If not, we shake a couple frames of bees in there, put the lid on, and the lid on is the sign for the helper who's picking them up to put them onto the truck. And they go, we would make Henry Ford proud. So we'll, we'll we make 150 nukes uh, in, a, in a short afternoon, uh, day after day. So, so we just, just blast through these nukes. It takes very little time to make these uh, nukes. And we're finding most of the queens. Unless it's raining or snowing, we don't look for the queens. But if it's, if it's not raining or snowing, we, uh, we find most of the queens. So here's, here's Eric. His job then is to bring these over. Now here's the trick. You make all your nukes away from the parent colony. Eric has to wear a fair amount of gear because the older bees come back and they say, where's my hive? I need to sting somebody. <laughs> Meanwhile, we can be doing it here and we don't even have to put gear on necessarily because it's all the, any bees that are going to sting you have already flown back to where Eric is. So you can work all day long, look at these splits. So here's, here's the deboxers, four deboxers with, with box on there, two nuke boxes in front of each, each one, and we're putting them in the order. So this, this hole right here is telling either one of us, this needs a frame of brood to finish it off. So either one of us can finish that one off, slap a lid on it, and then it gets carried away. You, you follow the, the thing? So it's just, it's just full tilt boogie making these uh, nukes. Uh, typical scene of us in the yard. So we just carry this apparatus on the back of the truck to each yard. You just, we show up and just wham, bam. We, we call it yard trashing because there's nothing left in the yard except for what we'll do is now that we've shifted to saving the second year queens, we'll put them down with one or two frames of brood in a single and they pick up the drift of coming back and they just take right off again. So that queen's already in full lay. She picks up the extra drift and the, that colony will then be a honey producer. Any questions on this? Okay, Ian wanted me to, to elaborate on our nuke making, so that's why I'm spending a little, a little more time. Yeah? Uh, you said if it's poor weather, you won't bother looking for the queen when you're splitting the nukes. Right. So how do you know where your queen is going? Or is that not an issue? I'm not understanding it, that. Well, oh, it's very easy. 
When you go back, we, let, we put the nukes down, let them sit for a day. We're going to put the queen cell in the next day. When you go back there, the occasional hive will have a big beard on front of it. Okay, so that tells us, here's where the queen is. So that's the second year one. We know that. So we either then, we have choices at that point. If we have any weak nukes where the bees have drifted from, we'll just, we'll, we'll, we'll look for the queen in that crowded one and add bees back to the other ones. Or we just pick that up and put it on the truck on the way home, and we take it to the, to the yard with, with second years. So it's really easy to, find, to identify the ones with second years. Even if we miss her at that point, when we go back for mate out uh, an egg laying check two week, or 19 days later, anyone with a second year, uh, the first year ones will have a little bit of brood in the, in the middle looking good, but the second years will be four frames of so solid sealed brood uh, and have plugged out the nuke entirely. So it's very easy to recover any second year queens that we, we missed. So it's not worth the time, wasting time looking for them because it's very easy to pick them up later on and just throw them on the truck and, and head them back to the, to the yard. Does that answer your question? Okay. Um, okay, so if it's rainy, we just change our, our gear. If it's even rainier, we, <laughs> we put up a tent over us. If it's snowing, same thing. Nothing stops us. We only, the only thing we change is, is the clothing we wear. Uh, for making up the nukes. Now, nobody asked me, why did I only put four frames in a five frame nuke box? Well, one, it gives you more space when you go back to look for the queen for laying, because now you have room to maneuver and more room to put the queen cell in. But the main thing is, four out of five on average made out. So we, we take a 20 frame colony, make five four frame, oh God, you guys, I, we did the birth break test before. Maybe I should show you a picture, okay? So, <laughs> no, 20 frame colony, you can make five four frame nukes. Since 80% since were made out, you're only gonna wind up with four, which means you have four extra frames, and the one that didn't made out, those four frames fill out the fifth frame in the other four boxes. So you, so you first make up five four frame nukes, and then you condense it down to four five frame nukes, okay? So just we, over the years, we found out this works really, really well for us. The next day we, we uh, pop queen cells in. So we have little tote boxes that we, have, that we hold in our incubator that have a gel pack in them that hold the temperature. Um, when, we sell nukes, the, when we sell queen cells, we sell a ton of queen cells to other beekeepers. Um, and what, what I finally bought was a, an infrared uh, digital thermometer because they come over with their boxes and we found out some people are sloppy on the temperature and they wind up either chilling or, or cooking all their queen cells. So we, we check every box, anybody, a transportation box, they bring over with the infrared thermometer and make sure they're not going to kill the, the queen cells. Um, we're in the enviable position that we, I think I advertised once in 1980 or something like that. If we, we don't advertise. We, 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 have, we can't even begin to fill our market. We get two, three times the demand for everything that we do. So, um, um, so when I'm talking, I'm not doing a sales pitch. Uh, uh, people, uh, there's big demand for what we do. Okay, so then we set the nukes out. We usually we use these five frame nukes. Uh, we also do uh, uh, singles divided with a piece of plywood, uh, a plywood divider board, and have uh, two queens mating out. Um, th those are handy because if you get two queens mating out, if you have the time, you can pull one queen out put her in a cage and sell her, and then just pull the plywood divider up, and now you have a really strong nuke with the other remaining queen. Or if you don't have the time, you just pull the plywood out and let the bees decide what to do with the queens. Because at that point, I, fig I, I figured I have less than a dollar invested into that queen. So it's actually more cost effective for me to just waste the queen by pulling the plywood out, because it take, if it's gonna take me more than a dollar's worth of labor to find that queen, um, it may not be worth it unless I have somebody who wants to pay me a bunch for the queen. So, we, would, we make much more money. We've, we've, we've run the numbers. My, my son, a few years ago, said, Dad, why aren't we selling packages? Or why, why aren't we selling uh, queens? I said, let's do the numbers. Let's raise 100 queens and keep track of, of every hour or every minute and every penny we put into that. And let's then uh, uh, raise 100 nukes. And then we'll use those 100 queens, take that cost, and then go out and shake packages and make the packages too. And uh, then I ran all the numbers. and and gave them to him and I said, so here's how much, and then you break out how much we make per hour. And he looks pretty, he looked at the uh, packages and he goes, oh yeah, that's, uh, that's not bad wages. And then he looked at the um, selling the queens, he goes, yeah, that's not bad wages. And then he looked at the, 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 like, the nukes. 
And uh, it came out to be something like $400 an hour is what we make. And he goes, oh, no, Dad, that's, that number's not right. And I go, oh, shit, what's he? He goes, we don't spend that much time making the nukes. <laughs> you overestimated the amount of time. Here's the deal. We make so much per hour making nukes that when my sons came on board, I said, here's what, here's what you got. In January, when you use your calendars, you get yourself a felt pen, and you go from the middle of March till the end of April, and you just black out all those dates, and then you hand the calendar to your wife, because you do not exist. <laughs> so my son, Eric, he leaves in the morning before the kids get up, and he gets home at night after they go to sleep. He goes for a week at a time without seeing his kids, because when you're making $400 an hour, and you have a narrow window to do it, you know, that's a, that's a tough choice, okay? Because you don't make anything the rest of the year. So we, in, we make our whole income in, in two months worth of work um, during the year. Okay, we don't usually have to feed. Uh, now with climate change, the last couple of years in the drought, we have had to feed the nukes, but generally we just put a full frame of honey in them. In them. And then they fly out to, uh, to mate. I took this picture with a little pocket camera down at Ray Oliveris' uh, yard. They, they, the, you, can watch, you can watch the drone comments in the meeting, right? Just at you know, ceiling level or sometimes at head level right in front of you. And if I blow it up, you can see there's the virgin queen. There's a, a uh, well, she's not a virgin anymore. Uh, there's a drone <laughs> starting to mate her, to mount her, and there's the last lucky drone right there. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's rapid fire in the air. Okay, then a few days later, we'll get the mating sign on the, on the queens. And if we've had bad weather, we just watch the thermometer and men when that temperature hits 70 degrees Fahrenheit, even 69, all of a sudden this roar of the drones come out, typically around 1.30, 2 in the afternoon. And if I go out and start popping lids a minute later, you see all these happy queens with the mating sign have just, just come back. And sometimes they'll mate out a thousand queens in less than an hour. And you can go back and check it and see them uh, coming back with the mating sign. Um, okay, so then we let them sit there. We let them lay until they've established a nice brood pattern before we sell them. And then we uh, uh, look for them here. And then we, we just sell our, all our nooks with a no questions asked uh, return policy that we'll swap out. If anybody's unhappy about anything, we just will swap it out for another, another nuke. So um, we have very few people ever take us up on that. Um, now, we also changed something. We used to look for, uh, check for made out at, at, at 14 days. But I realized you have a window of opportunity at 19 days. 19 days after the day that you remove the frames from the laying queen, you got a one day window when there's not a cell of sealed brood in the hive. It's only one, one, one day. And if it's warm, it's, it has to move it up to like day 17, uh, maybe. So we just hit them with, so it's, we, we hold off now to do our, our, our queen shot from made out. So what you do is you, you pull, you only have four frames, really quickly you open it up. Oh, see a queen's laying, popping in there. Leave it open until you find one that didn't mate out, and you add the last frame. When you put the last frame in, you get the oxalic acid uh, dribble, and you go, it takes you five seconds to do it. Cost you less than a nickel. Put the lid on. Now you've got a new queen and a new nuke, and you've controlled 95% of the mites. So we start a whole operation off clean with mite-free colonies for five seconds worth of work with the oxalic acid dribble. That just revolutionized our, our beekeeping a number of years ago. And our clientele loves getting these mite-free nukes with these uh, beautiful uh, young queens. And we don't sell them to treatment-free beekeepers. Yeah, we just uh, we'd say, no, we're, we're, we love our queens, we're proud of them, we're not gonna let you kill them. So if you, if you don't promise that you're gonna uh, treat for mites, we're not gonna sell you any nukes. Um, and we have people coming from all over the West United States and picking up loads of nukes and uh, and uh, taking them. Um, in fact, this, this last spring, here's at our home yard, Eric says, okay, we're gonna save our time, we're gonna sell all of our nukes on just Saturdays rather than having people show up all the time. And I said, oh, I'm gonna be out of town, I'm speaking. And, and Ian says, oh God, I promised my girlfriend I was gonna be gone. Eric says, okay, I'll do it myself. So they set up some plywood signs with arrows and made a loop around our upper bee yard so that cars could pull in and pull out. Eric says, it's a good thing I had a good breakfast because I showed up at 7.30 and I didn't take a break until dusk and I sold $30,000 worth of nukes in one day by myself. <laughs> yeah, so, I, and, oh, and...
Um, is the camera still on? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Edit that out, okay? <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's beautiful because, um, you know, if you're a commercial beekeeper, then we get a check. But a, a large part of our market is hobby beekeepers, and they don't write anything off, so, so they just, we just say we're not interested in anything other than cash, um, and so they bring green cash. Um, I also help uh, other um, local clubs where they're trying to do a breed breeding program so they can mate locally adapted um, um, uh, breeder queens that they like, and I'll supply the queenless nukes right here. Um, and what we'll do is we'll, we'll, we'll go through uh, strong colonies the, uh, a couple of days before, cage the queen, and then rearrange in the double deep four nukes all set up in that double, double deep. And um, um, so when we get there, we pull the cage queen out and then drop all the frames into their nuke boxes, and then put a queen cell in the next day. I'll tell you in a minute what we do with those uh, queen. Oh, there we go. So we're, my sons and I were driving back a few years ago from making this big sale. He's got a big, just $6,000 check for selling a bunch of these queenless nukes to somebody. And my son says, Dad, I got this box of all these um, 50 queens that are beautiful laying queens in cages. And we got, they're, they're second year queens. We got nothing to do with them. And I go, Eric, check your cell phone. What's the weather forecast for the next 10 days? He goes, oh, it's going to be sunny and good fight weather. I go, oh, give me a second. I dial a number, I say, hey, Keith, any chance you get 500 pounds of bulk bees here tomorrow? He goes, tomorrow? I said, yeah, can you do that? And he goes, yeah, I, I, I can do that. I said, great, see you tomorrow. And because you know, bulk bees are a commodity in California at that time. And my sons look at me and they go, they got the $6,000 in their pocket. They said, how much is those 500 pounds of bulk bees going to cost? And I said, $5,000. I said, Dad, are you out of your mind? We just made $6,000 and now you're going to sell them bees and now you're going to buy $5,000 worth of bees? I said, guys, you got to recognize, first understand bee biology, understand business, understand opportunity. Give me a chance. So we go back home. I said, we have... Um, We've got 100 boxes of drawn comb, you know, sitting at home, right? And they said, yeah, just sitting right in that yard. I said, we're going to get home. We're going to grab pop, bottom, pop boards and bottom boards and go out to that yard. So we go out to that yard and we set up uh, 50 hives, double deeps of drawn comb with a top and a bottom, no bees in them. And the next day, the bees arrive. Now, this is a different picture from us, just singles. But uh, that day, it was all doubles. And 500 pounds of bees show up. So we take those 50 queens, you put one queen in the cage in each one of those double deeps, and you dump 10 pounds of bees on the ground in front of them. It's pretty impressive when you dump 10 pounds of bees, but dump 500 pounds of bees on the ground. And the, guy, the, the guys who deliver them go, they're expecting this to shake them through a funnel into packages. They go, what the hell are you doing? Just dump one 500 pounds of 5,000 dollars of bees on the ground? Well, those bees smell that queen inside, and they walk right in there. So it takes a half a pound of bees to cover a frame. You got 20 frames in there, you put 10 frames of bees in there, so you're covering how many frames with bees? You're putting, covering 20 frames, solid with bees. With a queen and full lay in the cage, ready to go, we got 10 days of weather and there was a nectar and pollen flow on. This stuff, but, but we, what we knew of, because man, it is blooming. Um, so <laughs> by the next day, they've all settled down. 10 days later, they have several frames of brood across the bottom. They've put, filled the top full of honey, and we can nuke them up and double our, or triple our money in 10 days. So I said, boys, don't miss an opportunity when an opportunity presents, okay? Always think about all your options right there. So um, we've done this a number of times uh, since then. Okay, so once the nukes are made it out and the queens are laying, we've sold the nukes, then we start transferring the nukes for ourselves into, uh, from the nuke boxes to the singles. Very busy in, in the springtime. The black bear is getting ready to flow, um, and we start setting our, our, our yards up. We start at the lower elevation yards. Where I live, we live on, on the Sierra, so we, all of our yards are within 25 minutes of home, but there's... Oh, 2,500 feet elevation difference between our lower yard and upper yard. So we start at the lower yards and then we follow the bloom by stocking the yards going up uh, higher and, and higher. And by the way, we always breed for gentle bees. Um, I don't even, uh, it, it's very rare for me to dig behind the seat and, and, and find a veil. Um, and we never wear gloves. And, um, the boys used to just have a loose veil and a t-shirt uh, on. Oh, this is a yard. <laughs> 
This is a group of nukes right here that the morning before we were on our knees, all three of us, going through those nukes. And we drove back the next day, and this tree that night had just fallen over and crushed them all. We said, God, that was good timing on our part. <laughs> Um, if we didn't used to ever have to feed our nukes, but now we, we do with, um, with the drought or climate change. We're, the plant phenology is changing, so yards that were meted out highs for 30-some years, the bloom is not the same any, anymore. We do have to have bear fences around all of our yards. We've got black bears, and uh, we find that these simple fences is all it takes for us to uh, keep them, um, the, the bears in check. Bears do not jump, so we put them just high enough you can just clear your balls when you step over the, <laughs> over the fence, okay? Um, <laughs> something else I, I don't know if I'm just convincing. <laughs> All right, well, some, some, some of our help learns slower than others. Um, <laughs> um, but you can train a bear in one event, okay? <laughs> Some beekeeper takes more. I had an electrical engineer follow me one time, and he was bragging about being an electrical engineer and all this hot shot electrical. And he goes, hey, Randy, my legs are as tall as yours. Uh, I didn't know if I could step over this fence. So I said, oh, just take your hive tool and push it down. Thinking, being an electrical engineer, he would get the joke. No, he didn't get the joke. <laughs> And uh, from time to time, a bear does uh, get you, and it's pretty ugly. And uh, they, a bear, some, some bears just, uh, it's like a, it looks like a cantaloupe afterwards. They've just eaten everything right out of there. Um, but what we do is, is we don't want to hurt any bear because we want to train our local big bad bear. Because that local big bad bear, once he's been trained to the fence, will never go through it, and it keeps any other bears from coming to the neighborhood. If you harm your local bear, then you got to just keep training each new bear. So we, uh, we don't harm skunks, we don't harm bears, we just train them. Um, and we coexist with, with them. Uh, we do have to weed whack a lot. We get a lot of, uh, of growth uh, growing um, up until about the middle of June, and then, then we don't have to do any more weed whacking after that. Okay. So we try to avoid uh, the swarming. Of course, you're never going to avoid all the, all the swarming. Um, once those, they've built up to um, uh, big, strong singles, uh, we, we put a box of foundation on. So we have 5,000 frames of foundation to draw, and we get our best luck putting 10 frames of foundation directly above that single during our early honey flow. So what we do is we sacrifice the honey crop for nuke sales. Um, we do make some honey, but the honey is not our major uh, thing. We make much more money, as I said, per hour with nukes than we do for making uh, honey. And at this time, I'm also involved. We, we, uh, I've got school classes coming over, uh, looking at bees, um, beginner's classes. One of the things I always do in my beginner's classes is I shake a tub full of bees, have the old ones fly off, and I ask for a volunteer, and I scoop up a double handful of bees and put it in their, high, their hands like this. And at this point, it's a paradigm shift for everybody in the group. And they go, oh my God, can I try that? And pretty soon everybody gets a handful of bees in their bare hands. And they've all gone from being terrified of going out to the bee yard the first time going, oh my God, this is what beekeeping is like? And it's, I found this to be the most powerful thing I can do in my beginner's class in the field session is to just get, say, hey, this is really how you can handle bees if you know how to work with bees, and it works, it works beautifully. I don't recommend you guys do it, but um, it, it, it works. And look, make sure that if you do it, their sleeves are tight. That nobody ever gets stung unless a bee gets under um, a cuff, so I make sure they have uh, tight sleeves. Uh, then we uh, go to, the, I have a booth at the fair. We have a, a, a booth that we built 35 years ago that has uh, two observation hives, and then a few years ago, I built this 10-foot um, high foldable booth with black screen on it, with a beehive inside and a little rail here around. And then once a day, we go out there, open it up, and pull out frames and do an entire inspection with no gear on. And it's a whole different experience than having the bees behind the glass. That the people have their noses right up here, and they go, oh, wow, that's what beekeeping is like? Oh, and the top is open. The bees fly free over their heads. So it's, uh, and the fair loves it. The fair has no problem with this. Um, we have livestock right here, so, we, so when we close it back up, we put a jar of, of, uh, of water with a little bit of sugar in it on the top so the bees don't go to the water troughs of the uh, livestock. 
and we get no complaints in the fair, and this is an incredibly popular and, uh, exhibit at the fairgrounds of the daily inspection of the hive, and it just changes people's whole perception of beekeeping. Um, we we'll also travel. Here's uh, Eric and I went down to uh, Veracruz, Mexico, and uh, we went to demonstrate alcohol wash. We didn't bring any isopropyl alcohol with us. <laughs> so they said, hey, we got some tequila here. <laughs> and uh, and uh, so we call, they, they called this uh, uh, tequila de, de, de uh, Baroa <laughs> down here. And uh, that we learned something, though, because we were in pickup trucks, and at each we went to several yards. Each yard, this bottle of tequila kept getting lower at each yard. We couldn't figure out what was happening in the back of the pickup truck there. <laughs> and then uh, research projects. I'm always doing research projects. Here I'm um, uh, grading colonies for strength with the cluster grading, grading right here. So um, uh, that keeps us busy. And then we let the bees build up for the main flow, getting these big old frames of brood so they're ready uh, to go. Then just before the main flow, we start selecting our, our potential uh, breeders. Um, and Les's presentation was, was excellent. Man, if I were perfect, that's what I would, would, would do. Um, what we do is, number one, our main selling point is gentleness. We have a reputation for having the gentlest bees of, of anybody. So um, if, if they're not totally gentle colonies, they're just not even considered, OK? The second, they got to make honey. So they got to be in the, in the top. When you're, breeding, when you're doing breeding, you're not creating anything new. You're eliminating all the things that you don't want, and then you're selecting for recombinations, new regulatory cascades of existing alleles that are in your, your bees. So they already have all the, behave, all the alleles necessary for being mite resistant, and, and tracheal mite resistant, and uh, nosema resistant, and, and uh, foulbrood resistant. You just gotta just eliminate the ones that aren't and maybe select for certain combinations that work. And, then, and that's the tricky part, is, is, is combining these alleles in the right types of combinations for regulatory cascades. So um, our number one selection criteria is now might. We already had bees that were gentle, already had bees that were honey producers, already had bees that were resistant to foul brood. So we shifted. So what I wanna select for now is absolutely gentle, within the top 50% in any yard of honey production. So just above average for honey production because we're not that interested in honey. But the 2% the best on varroa resistance. So that's what we, we've shifted over. You can only bridge select for so many things where you just go crazy with Excel spreadsheets and stuff. So we keep it pretty simple right now. If they're, if they're not gentle, they're a no-go. If they're not as good as at least half the bees in the yard for honey production, they're a no-go and then they have to pass the Varroa um, uh, test. So the very simple suction criteria. Then the honey flow comes on, Himalaya blackberry uh, comes into bloom. Uh, it didn't during the drought. Um, and this is our, traditionally our main honey crop right here. And uh, the nice honey flow in the morning. This was taken in the morning, the year before the drought, and that would be a typical shake. So we have very low humidity, so all our honey is cured overnight. So anything that shakes out in the morning was brought in that morning. That'd be a typical nectar shake. The next five years in the same yard at the same, same stage of bloom at the same time of day, I'd be lucky to get three to four drops. The blackberry just, I don't know why, they bloom normally, they look normally, they produce fruit, but they just, the bees ignore the blossoms except for, for pollen. There was no bees with, with, with fat abdomen on the blackberry. So the blackberry plants for some reason just stopped producing nectar. So what used to be our major honey flow just stopped for five years. Last year was the first year we got a, a blackberry crop, a, again, a, a light crop. I'm hoping we're gonna get a decent crop this year because it used to be a very reliable crop. So during the drought, we don't even, a lot of hives, we never even got up to a uh, third super. Um, you know, typically we could draw one to two deep supers, start with a nuke, build into a double, and then one to two deep supers of honey on top of that. So the boys go out and um, after the blackberry flow, the light colored honey, they'll go pull combs um, from the brood nest because we have another little flow that comes after that of less quality honey. Uh, at this point right now, we do a, a varroa knockback. So we watch our mite levels, and if varroa is starting to creep up, as, um, as Les said, uh, we don't wait for it to come up and take it down. We never let varroa rise. We never get above uh, um, a, a two percent infestation in our hives. So if we get, if we start hitting five, six mites in an alcohol wash, we're on it right there. We never ever 
let Vero get, get up. So we'll use uh, formic acid during the honey flow to knock them back a little bit, and then we'll harvest the, uh, the honey. Then it dries up, and there's just nothing out there. So now it's just uh, letting the bees just go into kind of suspended animation during the uh, summer. Now many beekeepers do what uh, herders do. You move your bees to better pasture. So we used to, for 25 years, at this point in time, I'd move all my bees up over the Sierra to irrigated alfalfa up in Nevada where there was sweet clover and rabbit brush and the alfalfa, and beekeeping was easy up there. But when the boys came on board, the lifestyle didn't fit us. They would rather be home each day for dinner. So now, instead of moving the, uh, the hives, well, all we do is um, we, we learn how to use pollen sub and we keep them at home, and we're home every night for, for dinner. But uh, if many, there's, not, there's nowhere near enough forage in California for the number of hives that are there for almond pollination. So they uh, mainly move up to the Dakotas or down to Texas. And we have guys coming from Florida, uh, Pennsylvania, over to uh, California to pollinate almonds. So it's a huge transport throughout the United States. Then, interesting, we always got a little bit of this dark honeydew from the California incense cedar. If you sharpen a pencil, that smell that you smell is California incense cedar. That's the smell that's used for pencil wood. And um, there's an insect that lives under the bark, and it exudes honeydew. And when we see the bark turn black like this, that's a mildew that grows on that ex exuded honeydew from those sap-sucking insects. And if that's the case, um, we'll see the bees start working that honeydew on the bark. So odd thing was, we used to be able to pull our, our, our wildflower and blackberry honey, the light-colored honey, and then this dark honeydew would come in. And to us, it kind of tastes like, like yucky molasses with this kind of cloying flavor. We never cared for it. And uh, so we'd leave it on for winter feed and, and supplement it with some sugar to, to dilute it. And then during the drought, I have no idea why, but in August, when there's no floral honey, these trees start producing this honeydew, and we were drawing deeps of foundation solid full of honeydew, which is something we had never seen happen before. Don't ask me biologically. I have a late awake at night trying to figure out why that would work. So Eric says, God, Dad, we got some of this honeydew, but it's not, it didn't come in as dark and as strong as it used to. It's kind of light colored. There's a little bit of yellow star thistle, maybe something. I don't, don't know what. Do you think I should put some on the shelf? Because we're out of our normal honey. So should we put it on, in the store shelves? And I said, well, give it a try. And our clientele loves it. And our, we now have a clientele that doesn't want the floral honey anymore. All they want is this honeydew blend. It's a, it's a, a European taste. So the honey that we prefer is not the honey that we sell. We, we respond to what the... The, uh, the buyers uh, want. So we're, if we start making blackberry again, we'll, we'll do um, two different honey crops, a light one and, and a darker one. Okay, and now serious into Varroa mansion. That's back when we used to use the, um, the shaker bottle. We no longer use the shaker at all. Uh, beekeeper and number one, yeah. So here's what, we, what I see. If you have less than six mites in alcohol wash, we don't notice any kind of effect. When you get up to 15 to 20 mites, um, it affects colony buildup. So when I do these trials, these colonies in this mid-range mite level, they don't die, they don't look sick, but they don't build at the rate that a low mite colony will. So the, the deformed wing virus is starting to have an effect, the fro is starting to have an effect. When you get up to 25 to 50 mites in the alcohol wash, then the deformed wing virus suddenly starts to tip, the transmission starts to amplify, the varroa feeds on, as I said yesterday, um, it starts to feed on those highly high mite or uh, virus titer nurse bees, and then when they feed on the pupae, the pupae get injected with a higher titer of deformed wing virus. And typically, when you start getting around that 50 to 60 uh, mites in alcohol wash, then you start seeing the colonies collapse. So we we never let them get above this point right here. We avoid this whole whole thing. This is our our mite management. We, we bring our colonies back from almonds, strong. Mite levels are starting to get up around that four or five level. We split them all. Um, we, we have a drone trap frame in every one. We pull the drone trap frame out. The reason for the drone trap frame, we started putting them in some years ago for varroa control. They don't do much for varroa control. But if you put a drone, but if you don't have a drone trap frame in, when you come back from almonds, the bees have built drone comb all between the bottom bars and the top bars, and we have to scrape that off when we're making our nukes. If we put a drone trap frame in, they don't do that. All of our combs are beautiful, and they don't 
and when they draw a comb, they don't make any dr drone brood in our combs. Our business is selling perfect frames and nukes. We don't want drone brood in our nuke frames. So if we put one drone frame in every colony, when we come back to almonds, we get 100% worker brood on these beautiful combs. So now we do this. We do get a little bit of rural control, but essentially it's for drawing straight frames. So then we split our colonies uh, four ways at that point, do the oxyog dribble, and we drop our mite levels down to zeros or, or ones then. During the middle of our honey flow, we start uh, hitting this, um, this you know, five level. We'll give them a formic flash. And then uh, when the honey flow is over, then uh, we don't need any brood. Any bees that emerge from the brood at that time of year are never going to make it into winter. They're, they'd be too old. So we do a, a thymol treatment, Apigard a gel treatment, um, two rounds of 50 grams. And um, that just shuts the colonies down and it eliminates the mites very nicely. And as soon as we're done with that, first of September, we start feeding protein here and build those colonies up to get those healthy, mite-free, virus-free bees getting ready for winter. And then we'll do, give them an oxalic dribble once they, uh, when they shrink the brood nest down. And, uh, and this, is, this is what we repeat um, all throughout the year. Keep, we never let our mite levels get above an alcohol wash of six mites uh, uh, for a half cup of bees. Okay, and we do it with our smoking hot mite washing. At that time, this is when we do our selection for our, our breeders. The beauty is, so here's, this is some of our, we have about 50 yards of bees. So for each yard, I can then do a histogram of how uh, our mites, so, look, so this one right here says, out of, at this yard, um, so this is our frequency, it says that there were 10 colonies that had a mite counts between zero and one. There are 12 colonies that had mite counts between uh, two and three, and um, 13 colonies that had mite counts between uh, four and five. And then you find out, oh, well, here's one colony that had, had, had uh, mite count you know, over 20. That's a mite bomb. And then we had these ones that had mite counts of zero. So that's a potential breeder. So we marked those potential breeders. And then all of these, we put 300 milliliters of formic acid on them, split, break them into singles, put 300 milliliters on each one, and it's hot, it's hot weather at that time, and that just eliminates the mites, and we don't want that queen because it's a mite bomb queen, so we just eliminate them early in the season. By controlling these bombs, this small proportion, look at these, here's, here's one here, with more than 50 mites, when most of them are way down there in just a, a couple of mites. By eliminating these outliers, these, these high mite bombs, it changes all of our varroa management in our yards. It keeps the varroa level down in all the yards. So we found out that by alcohol washing, it costs us a dollar to a dollar and a half per hive labor for the crew to go out there and get alcohol washed on every one. It pays for itself because we don't even have to treat these ones that are in the zeros. So our savings in mite treatments pays for the labor for this, and we wind up with healthier colonies and a breeder program at almost no cost. Okay? You might want to consider it. Um, okay, formic acid, lemsuprazon, apigard, mid-August. And here's the formic blast. What we are using is, um, I don't know if it's illegal, but we're reusing, uh, we had a pallet of these old Mighty Way 2 pads, and we just uh, recharge them with uh, formic acid and uh, use them over and over again in a rim. And we've broken these colonies down to singles, and we blast them hard. And um, uh, once they're blasted, it doesn't kill the sealed brood. Sealed brood is fine, but it kills all the mites in the sealed brood. It does kill most of, the, of those queens. The, if, you, if you're not trying to kill a queen in hot weather with formic, it's really hard. If you're trying to kill the queen, <laughs> it's really hard too. They, they go, oh yeah, I'll show you. <laughs> and so some of those t second year queens are just tenacious and they'll just, they'll just live with that, just amazing. Okay, now we start monitoring for this late summer nutrition. There's nothing blooming out there at, at all. And what we do is we watch the jelly around the larvae, as I said yesterday. We pull up to the yard. The first person out of the truck just jumps out, lights a smoker, runs to a hive, pulls a frame of brood out of the middle of the hive, and says, brood's looking nice and wet, or the brood is starting to look dry. They're starting to cut back the amount of jelly that they're feeding larvae. So this colony right here is in severe nutritional stress. These larvae are all growing, but look at that. They're only, the nurses are only giving those larvae just enough jelly to make it through the day. The larvae eat their way in a circle around the bottom of the cell eating that jelly, and the nurses can either fill the bottom of the cell solid, or they can put just a dab of jelly in front of those larvae. So when we start seeing this, this means, man, this is the time to get pollen sub on uh, those hives. Um, and over the years, what we found 
is if there's a string of yards and some yards go, oh no, they still look good, but this next one's cutting back on the jelly. But well, we won't feed this one yet. We'll wait two weeks, but we'll feed these pollen up. And what we found, you know, we say, God, I told myself, told us last year we weren't going to make that mistake again, and I did it again. Yeah. Well, after a few years saying that, we realized, no, when the first yard starts showing the cutback in jelly, we feed them all. Because what happened is you come back two months later, and the yards that look really good that you didn't feed that day, they look like shit. And the ones that were looking lousy that you fed look beautiful. So now we just, when the first yards start cutting back on the jelly, we uh, feed them all pollen sub. And uh, quite a bit, th three to 10 pounds during that period of, of time. The other thing is we used to get this, this brilliant fluorescent orange bee bread packed around the colonies at that time. Looks pretty good, huh? Look at the brood pattern. Look at the dying larvae. Okay. Our colonies would just go to hell. We'd go, why would they go to hell with all that beautiful bee bread? And if you take it out and look under the microscope, those are not pollen grains. Not a single one. Those are all rust fungus spores from Euromyces rust fungus from the blackberry rust. And it tr they trick the bees with sugar to gathering them. And you see all these bright fluorescent orange pollen loads coming back and they pack them in there and your colonies just nosedive. So what we found is we hit them with um, pollen sub and we just rejuvenate the colonies just immediately, within two days. It just completely turns the colonies around and they're beautiful again. The thing we realize is when you have a dearth, your whole population starts to age. You, you go to it because they're not rearing brood and so you have a bunch of old bees in the hive. When you feed pollen sub, you're rejuvenizing it, re, re, rejuvenating that hive. Now instead of having a bunch of old bees in the hive, now you have a whole bunch of teenagers in the hive doing really well. And the teenage hive is always healthier than the geriatric hive. So that's what we do is we're rejuvenating our, the age structure by feeding the pollen sub. Okay, then uh, winter prep. Um, we, we'll, we'll move the higher elevation yards away from the snow areas down to lower elevation yards. Uh, heft them for weight, the oxalic acid dribble. And like I said, people say this takes too long. Two of us will do 400 hives a day in yards of 24 driving from yard to yard. I mean, how, how long does the dribble take? It's really, really quick. It's way faster for us to dribble than vaporization and way, and way safer for us to do that. We don't, you notice how much protective gear that we wear, wear when we're doing this. And then we're back to the beginning. That's the year. Any questions? Yeah. I'm glad you included that rust fungus. I read about that on your site. Um, but I have a question. Do they clean that out once you get the sub on? The rust fungus? Yeah. Yeah, they do. They do. Uh, I don't know what they <laughs> I don't know what they do with it or whether they consume it or I haven't, I don't see it on the landing board. So they might just consume it, but the, putting the policy on is enough to shift, shift the, we see the jelly just immediately start coming up and then the brood pattern just improves immediately. Awesome. It's like, it's like a magic wand putting on those pollen sub patties. You got one back there. I'm just wondering about the formic acid. Yeah. Um, how many ml? per population when you treat them. One population, population let's say, uh, one frame full of bees back to back, as for me it's one population, so how many ml uh, okay. of formic acid you need? Oh, okay, but well, we're using the Mite Away quick strips, and um, typically those colonies are, like, at that time of year, there are 15 to 20 frames of bees easily, maybe most of them around 20 frames, and we put one, one strip in, it doesn't give a high efficacy, it just knocks the mites okay. back about halfway to buy us time until we can put the, the time all on. Okay. So we're not looking for a complete mite kill, we're looking to avoid in the hot weather killing the queens. So we only use one strip instead of two. Okay, okay. Okay, does that answer your question? Yeah, Steve. Rob. I mean, Rob, I mean. <laughs> Everybody makes that mistake. I know. <laughs> um, Steve's much better looking than that. So, um, <laughs> but you're much smarter. Uh, uh, I was, two questions. One is, yeah. um, what do you guys do with your drone brood that you pull? What we do, we just uh, slice it out and just and give it the chickens or toss it on the ground. Okay, and the second question, how many bees in your half cup, just so that people know? Oh, there's, there's uh, typically runs about 325 bees. 
and a half cup, any, you know, anywhere from 310 to 340, but um, depends on how much uh, nectar is in their abdomen. So it's a little over 300 bees. We don't normally count them, right. but from time to time we do. 